We now continue with um, Eddie de Klerk, and I'll briefly, briefly say a couple of words, and then you can say many things. But uh, Eddie uh, was, uh, well, is very, very famous uh, for organizing nightlife here in Amsterdam. From his first club, The Core, in 1980, very close by, where he played new wave, post-punk, electronic uh, dance music, uh, etc., disco, mixed with performances to the Roxy, the famous Roxy Club that he was one of the founders and artistic director of for many years, introducing house in the Netherlands. We can go on and on. But he has a much story to tell and he has many objects and he will tell some of his stories from the objects. And we are so happy to have you here. Thank you. Can you come? Distinguished guests, hosts, and organiz organization of Narcotic City, welcome. These archives are something really special and new, even for me. Um, I didn't even realize this until I met Anna Marie from the Amsterdam Museum, who came by and searched my archive. And I was totally shocked by her enthusiasm. <laughs> so actually, that's the reason I'm here tonight. Um, welcome to Amsterdam. Bienvenue, welcome. You're in a big party city, as I used to call it. I'm not sure if it still is, but it used to be. But Amsterdam is still, and it probably will be, one of the biggest references to drug culture probably in Europe. I don't like to top things like, you know, one, two, three, but Amsterdam has always had this history and it still has its living history. And um, I just want to tell something about my past when I came from Belgium. I'm a born Belgian, I'm not a Dutchman. And I came here, I landed here in Amsterdam 45 years ago. And I was working then and as I am now as a DJ, producer, and I worked in a club in Brussels, very young, I was 15 years old, I ran away from home and came into this club and started playing records. And I'm still doing it, once in a while. <laughs> but um, when I came to Amsterdam, this city was so attractive, it was so full of life, there was so much creativity, and Amsterdam, Holland, is a liberal city climate it stimulates a lot of young people as you can see when you walk around amsterdam you will see most of them are very young just as you are actually i feel like one of the seniors but i think it's only a compliment really um and amsterdam is full of cliches really all the cliches are true believe me even the cliche that when you order cocaine it will come faster than your pizza that's typical Amsterdam. There has never been a problem, really. I'm not here and not standing here as an expert on drugs. Let me clarify that. I'm not here to tell you anything very new or interesting on that term. But I would like to share you, with you some personal stories. And these personal stories come out of my experience as a DJ producer and club owner. I stand here also on historic ground, since the Vrij Palais, where we are sitting right now, is actually the birthplace of alternative Amsterdam counterculture. This used to be the studio, the living room, and the workplace of Peter Giele. And Peter Giele was the founder of Aorta. And in this same room where you are now, I experienced in 1982 a big party with bands, mostly Amsterdam, German bands, English bands that were playing here post-punk music. And performances were happening with paintings and graffiti and Peter Giele hanging on a cross over the dance floor. This was the dance floor. And then sleeping on a bed, totally nude, on top of the dance floor. And it was like, just anything could happen. It was just like hell, heaven, in one moment. It was very youthful, creative, 
and what I call my home, very, you know, really amazing. From that encounter with Peter Giele, I met another guy who did a magazine called Vinyl, which was one of the first magazines in Holland, concentrating on punk and new wave music in the 80s. And together with Peter and Arjen Schaam, that was a guy from Vinyl magazine, we started the club Roxy. That was in 86, 1986. But before that, there was another historic place across the street, just near the dam, near the palace, where I opened my first club in 1980. And as you may know, as a DJ, I came from Belgium and I had a dream. And this dream was actually to open my own club, my own discotheque, in whatever, wherever. And Amsterdam fitted like a glove. It was just perfect. And I did. I started my club in 1980. And it was called the Coor. And the Coor is a Flemish word for toilet. It's where you dump your whatever, and it's where the owner of the cafe builds his stack of empty beer crates. <coughs> it's a typical Flemish word. And the Cour became like a playground for punk, new wave, but also disco people, um, fashion people, photographers, anything, anybody from high society to low culture came together. And that, I think, was for me, not new, but for Amsterdam, brand new. That was totally something unheard of. To bring all these cultures together in one club, where they could dance and drink and have, you know, good music, and especially lots of bands were performing there. So I think that was, my dream came true at that point. And it was also a time where speed, cocaine, glue, heroin, okay, it was very popular, but I was not, uh, what you call, really interested. I was quite a virgin at that point. I was more working on the club and the music and how it fitted with the public and as an owner as well, I was very much responsible for not having drugs rather than allowing drugs. So I was quite aware of um, any people doing drugs in the Coor, the club. But of course it happens, because it's, hey, it's Amsterdam, you know? Mm -hmm. And you can never forbid anything in Amsterdam. You have to be very playful when you are a club owner. So I was walking around when I was not playing music. I had other DJs or the bands were playing. So I was walking around the club and I saw a guy standing at the bar, tall guy, dressed in black, because that was the fashion at the time. Everybody looked like a raven. <laughs> and this guy had long black hair and he had a little package in his hand and a long fingernail and it is like dip at the bar in public. And I thought, hmm, that's not right. You should not do this in public. So I went over to him, and this guy actually happened to be one of the most famous artists of the time. He is, his name is Peter Pontiak, or his name was Peter Pontiak. He died a few years ago, God bless him. And he was famous for his drawings that were very much based on counterculture on drugs, since he was a big <laughs> user himself. And here you can see the Peter Pontiac did this, uh, what they call the Peter Stuyvesant uh, cocaine drawing. And I asked him actually to follow me and leave the club, which he did not want to do. He said, I'm standing here at the bar, and I'm fine, and I don't want to go, and why do you talk to me like that? You know, I can do anything I want. And I said, well, look, you're in a public space, it's a club, we don't allow it. So, with a lot of 
you know, conversations and fight, word fighting. At the end, I, I got my bouncer, the doorman, and we escorted, escorted him to the door, and they gently removed him from the club, which he did not like at all. So, at a point, I will tell you the story later, but this is a drawing he made of that very moment <laughs> when he was escorted from the club to the door. And he did not like it, and he said, poop, which means F you, <laughs> in very decent terms. Now, this T-shirt was actually made after he came back and asked me if he could come in again because he loved the club and he, he wanted to come back. All his friends were there and it was one of the only clubs he could go to. And so I said, okay, why not, you know. But you have to do something. I want you to draw in one act, one wall of t-shirts. So I made a wall as big as this wall in, in one of the entrance side halls of the club. I tacked 30 t-shirts to the wall, 10, 10, 10, 30 t-shirts to the wall. And I said to him, look, you've got to make a big painting like a panorama. And each t-shirt has to be different. And the last person leaving the club gets a t-shirt for free. And that's your reward and your payback to get back into the Coor Club. So he agreed. And that's how I got my t-shirt by Peter Komtje. <laughs> That's 1982, 1983. Um, after that, things got a little nasty and quite heavy because Amsterdam was very much invaded by lots of, let's say, people from outside Holland, punks, new wave, and also squatters because Amsterdam was very liberal with squatters. And this also is a squatters building originally in Aufta. The whole thing was as full this whole block was actually scored. There were artists like Art Veldhoen and Peter Gielen, they were all working here. And people were coming here, and you had Frankrijk here across the street, and then there was a, the Kaiser on the Kaiserstracht, and all these people became quite mingled with lots of Germans, English scorers, French, and things got a little nasty, and I didn't really like that. Although the music was great, we had a lot of German influences from Berlin. We called it the Berlin Bridge. And lots of Germans working here and Dutch working in Berlin. And I got out of the scene. I still played in Paradiso, playing my pet club nights. And then after two years, I met Peter and Arne, and we started Club Roxy. Now, Club Roxy is a very different story. Because I was the DJ and creative director, and as a manager, creative director, I wanted to have something new to bring to the crowd, music-wise, and also entertainment. And my dream always has been to mix theater and music in one club. So that's my sort of Belgian surrealistic nature, I guess. And the only new music at the time, 1985, was house music. House music is, of course, electronic dance music. And next to house music existed new beat, acid, techno, electronic body music, you name it. And that's the style I wanted to bring. So I did. And in the first year, it work, because people didn't know what it was, and they thought it was hysteric gay music, they, they did like the, the beats and they, they, they were like booing and cheering on the dance floor, so it was very tough. The first year, that was 1986, 87, and then suddenly there was a little change. It was not really that little, it was actually a big bang. House music exploded, exploded in Amsterdam. 
in Holland and in the rest of Europe. It was already happening in Ibiza, in Spain, and in England. And what I didn't realize was, at the time, that with music, the new music, also came a new drug, MDMA, ecstasy. And this button is actually the letter E, and it says E for ecstasy, also for Eddie, but that's earlier. But um, E, can you feel it? Of course, this is not about can you feel the music, but it means can you feel when the drug kicks in? And that's the meaning of this button. I will donate that later. Um, but the drug thing became also very, for us, something we could not actually handle. In Club Roxy, we had no idea what was going on. There were travelers from everywhere in the world who brought these new little bags with pills and things. And I never took it. I never did it. And people in the Roxy never did it. Nobody knew until somebody started it, as usual. And this happened to be one of the biggest hypes, I think, in Holland. Not only the music became big, but also the drug became a big, big, big hype. And it became so big that every newspaper, magazine, the whole press jumped on this hype of drug and new music. And at a certain point, in, I think it was 1980, no, 1994, 1994, where house music in Holland was equal to ecstasy. And I was totally not happy with that because a lot of people do go out and do not take drugs. You know, believe it or not, that it still happens, it still exists. And at a certain point, there was even in Holland a political party that invited me to come and play for a big rave. And I will show you the poster. This was for a political party. Um, have to check in 1984, and the political party is called Groen Links, <laughs> Green Left. And this is the flyer. It was in the Eiselhallen in Zwolle, and this is the lineup with me here headlining. Thank you. <laughs> and lots of people from England, Trevor Rockcliffe. Uh, Paul Elstak from uh, Rotterdam, Manu Le Malin from France, uh, Jeff Mills from, Tech, uh, from Detroit, Germany of course, and Tanit from everywhere. Just amazing. And this was organized by a political party to promote house music and at the same time ecstasy. <laughs> what they didn't actually realize yet that they were promoting a drug. But they did this for to get more young voters. And there were indeed like five, six thousand people there. But it became a big scandal actually. As did the whole thing with um, the drug ecstasy. Well, hello drug, hello ecstasy. I mean, it was like the most popular thing to do in Holland. And it created a new lifestyle of 24 hour parties. Just the same as it was in England or in Berlin or anywhere else. We suddenly felt like cosmopolitan here, you know? And this became also one of the moments that um, we in the Roxy, that is before 1994, that we're talking now around 1990, that we had to do something about the feminine ecstasy in Roxy, because it became actually a problem. There were dealers, we had already experience, of course, with speed and cocaine, but never with ecstasy, because that's invisible, it's so small. And we had to act. So I asked my manager, Hans Kuipers, that was the manager of the, for the club, and I said to him, look, we go to the police and we want to know what actually the policy is in terms of what to do when we have dealers inside the club. Mm -hmm. 
So we went to the police and we got to the officer and we said, look, there's this drug, blah, 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 and what do we do? They said, what? What drug? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, from that moment we had like a free ticket <laughs> for more parties and we had no really like consequences for any sort of restrictions or repercussions on you know the uses of the drugs inside the club. So the Roxy became quite the temple of acid house and drug ab abuse really. And I want to show you a little flyer, it's probably the smallest flyer in the world of <laughs> Dutch culture. And I would love to put it on a projector, but what I'd like to do is I put I give it to Stefan. And can you give it a round? Please do not open it or take the contents because the trick might start there. But this was a flyer for Asset Gala. And this was one of the first parties we organized in Club Proxy to promote music. Um, the first international Asset Gala. Enjoy this trick. <laughs> so, which brings me actually almost to the end of my story. Um, again, I'm no expert, and I don't know if I told you anything new, but the only thing new I would like to say to you is from my own experience, you do not need drugs. Music is a drug. Music wow. is the only drug. <laughs> <Voila>. <laughs> stories about nightlife, music, drugs and uh, how it all happens.